All righty. Welcome, everybody. My name is Allison Lafferlita. I'm the executive director for the Nonprofit Resource Hub. I would like to welcome all of you today to our webinar, Nonprofit Infrastructure, Navigating Needs, Spaces, and Solutions, presented by Glenn Landau and Ken Serini. Uh, we are really excited to have them here to present to you. Uh, prior to us getting started with them, I do just want to share a couple of things with you. If you are new to the Nonprofit Resource Hub, we are an association that provides education, support, and resources and services to the nonprofit world. It is free for a nonprofit organization to join. Uh, the application takes less than two minutes. Uh, as an executive director, I would encourage all of you to please go ahead and consider joining if you not aren't already a nonprofit partner, uh, you will have immediate access to really great resources that will be incredibly helpful to you. Uh, we also, as part of the uh, nonprofit partnership, we offer a lot of really great opportunities to meet and connect with those that are involved in our associate membership, like today's webinar. We also do workshops. We are going to be doing a meet and greet in person uh, on March 12th. And that is going to be at the Long Island Children's Museum. If you are a nonprofit organization, we would love for you to come and join us. In the chat, you will see a link with all the additional information for that. Later on in March, we're also going to be doing a virtual conference. Uh, this is a great opportunity for you to hop on. It's a half day. You can go in and out and her, excuse me, and hear from our experts about some really important industry topics that we're going to be addressing that you should know about. So that will also be in the chat for you as well. Uh, and if you have any questions about the Nonprofit Resource Hub, you are always welcome to check out the website or reach out to myself or Kellyanne Serini, uh, and we will be happy to answer those questions for you. We will also put our information in the chat. And I would encourage all of you to put your information in the chat as well. If you want to link in with each other, if you want to email, if you just want to introduce one another, and if you have any needs aside from money and board members, I always say, put those in. You never know who knows somebody that can help you here. So uh, without further ado, I would like to welcome all of you once again and introduce to you our speakers today. We have Glenn Landau, Principal Architect at Landau and Landau Architects. And we have Ken Serini, Managing Partner at Serini and Associates. And I would like to welcome you both. And thank you so much for taking your time today to share with us. Welcome. Hi, Allison. Thank you very much, Allison. Um, so first, let me just say it's an absolute pleasure to be presenting with um, the very esteemed Ken Serini of Serini Associates. Um, whose firm's own work with nonprofits, as most of you, if not all of you know, is very well renowned. And uh, I know he's got some extremely in useful insights to share with everybody. I myself am looking forward to hearing you know, what Ken has to say. Uh, over the years, our own architectural and interior design firm has worked with so many different types of nonprofits to reimagine their spaces, to renovate their spaces, in some cases, design new buildings. Uh, one thing that seems to be pervasive among so many is that rather than supporting their mission, instead, their infrastructure, their facilities seem to do everything possible to thwart their mission with one issue after another on almost a daily basis. So we put this together, this, this presentation, to describe a sort of data-driven analytical approach to address these infrastructure issues so that your facilities can start to work for you and not against you, so that you can focus on what matters, which is providing meaningful programming and services to your communities. Um, it's very important to remember that while there are best practices um, to follow, every organization is unique with its own mission, its own programs, culture, operations, and challenges. So while not everything we're gonna talk about today is necessarily gonna be applicable to you or your organization, hopefully there's enough in here that you can take away to start to think about you know, how some of these things may be applicable to you so that you can really start to benefit and reduce your overall operating costs. So without, with that, let me just go to our first slide. Well, Glenn, before we get started, if we can maybe just um, throw out a, a couple questions so we can take a poll so we can get some information about who we're talking to. So sure. if people don't mind um, answering a couple uh, really, really quick questions that have just popped on the screen. Um, this way, again, we get to understand what type of organization you are, um, who you are within the organization, and how large the organization is. So 
If you don't mind taking two seconds to answer the poll, that would be very helpful for us to direct the uh, conversation appropriately. So what is our goal? Um, our goal for you today is that you have the tools that you can be certain that you've got the right infrastructure in place to support your mission. And in doing so, as I said, minimize your operating costs. So there are three facility scenarios we tend to see with nonprofits that, that, that they're facing. Number one, you have no facilities. You don't have any need for any facilities. You're doing some everything remotely or virtually. Um, it's not an issue for you. Number two, you have an existing facility or maybe multiple buildings, a network. Maybe they're leased. Maybe they're purchased. Maybe you need to renovate or expand the buildings to help your operations. Or number three, you've decided, you know what, it's time for a new building or we need to expand into a new space, a new location. Um, and we're going to do a building that's specific to our needs, that's custom designed. We're going to assume, since you're here today, um, that unless you had an hour to kill with absolutely nothing better to do and no better offers, that number one does not apply to you. So we're just going to focus on numbers two and three. Um, and if anyone here really does have no facilities issues, at some point in the future, who knows what might happen. All right, so we seem to have the results. Ah. So it, it looks like we have a lot of people in the educational world, uh, about 47%. Um, health and welfare is about 20%. Healthcare is about 13%. And arts is about 20%. So good to know uh, in terms of the, um, the breakout of the, the group. Very good to know. And it's a nice mix, too, I would say. That's heartening. So. Let's let's delve right into this. So why does all of this matter? What's the impact? And I'm going to ask Ken to jump in in a second um, to talk about this a little bit. But we know that less than 35 percent of a nonprofit's budget generally going towards overhead. And of that, the percent that's spent on facilities and infrastructure is going to depend on just how much of a physical presence you and your organization need to support your mission and program. But every penny that's wasted on outdated facilities or inefficiencies is one less penny that you have to spend on programming and services. And can I know and from a financial standpoint, you deal with this on a daily basis? Yeah, I mean, when you think about it, um, the organization, the board has a fiduciary responsibility, right? To make decisions to benefit the long-term stability of the organization. Uh, and when you think about it and you think about your facility costs, facility costs are long-term decisions, right? So, you know, it's for most organizations, um, the investment in facility costs is one of the biggest investments they're going to make um, for the organization. Uh, and when you're kind of thinking about those facility cost investments, you got to kind of think in terms of, you know, uh, you got a monthly net. It's a fixed cost. As you said, you know, it's, it's part of that, you know, um, overhead type cost of the organization. So there's a fixed cost involved in it. So when you're kind of going through and you're trying to make decisions as to the space that you're going to take on or expansion or any of those things, you really have to look at it in terms of um, the long-term um, operations of the organization. Where's the organization going to be, you know, over the term of the lease? Are we sure that our government funding, if we're getting government funding or our contributions or our events, whatever our funding sources are, are those funding sources going to be there in the long term in order to be able to continue to uh, cover the cost of the um, building that we're looking at? Um, what happens if there are changes in our services? What happens if there's drops in enrollment? Um, what happens if a service that um, we think is a service that's going to be there forever goes away? If you um, were in the Office of People with Developmentally Disability World um, and you were providing Medicaid service coordination, that was a place where a lot of these OPWD providers were making money. And about six or seven years ago, um, OPWD did away with Medicaid service coordination and they changed the way this was this is being handled. All of a sudden a big you know, amount of revenue popped off the table. So kind of when you're going through this, you gotta think about a lot of these things. You know, when you think about it, labor is uh, typically the most expensive um, component of an organization's operations, followed by your your um, space costs, your occupancy costs. So this is for most organizations the second um, largest expenditure that they're going to have. You know, so when you're looking at space, and I know Glenn's going to talk about this more, and I'll talk about this more later. Also, is you need to look at you know how do we deliver services, 
um, you know, are those services are going to be delivered on a um, center-based uh, services? Are they uh, more remote type services, as Glenn mentioned a little bit earlier? Um, so, we're, you know, from a cost perspective and how we're spending that, that money, you know, does the space that we're taking on align with the revenue that's coming into the organization? And, you know, we do really need to make sure that we fully understand the cost structure of the organization. One of the things that we recommend is when you're going into uh, a new space or you're going to be expanding your operations, you go through a process of doing um, what's called a feasibility study. So you, you really take the time to understand um, how much the cost is going to be of the, the space. Um, what are we gonna be putting in the space? Where's that money gonna come from? And um, how reliable is that um, funding source in the long term in order to be able to ensure that we're going to have the resources in place to cover this either rent or building cost um, for the term of the time that we're going to have it. And obviously things like that change over time, um, but you want to make sure that um, for the most part that you've got this covered and thought out. And we're going to get into all of those things. Those are all excellent points and things that you need to keep in the back of your mind as we go through this. Um, unlike many issues that you face as a nonprofit, there actually is something that you can do about these facility costs, these facility issues. Uh, and really, it doesn't matter if your organization already has one building, um, a network of buildings. More often than not, what we see are nonprofits that are housed in buildings that were designed during a different era when programs or the delivery of services or care were different than today's models, or they were just designed uh, for a totally different use. Um, in fact, we see so many nonprofits shoehorn themselves into outdated buildings just to have a place to call home, and ultimately they pay the price in additional expenses that they really don't need to worry about. So here are some common issues that we generally run into. You have an inefficient building layout. The spaces are in the wrong locations. The room sizes are limiting. You don't have enough space. Um, you have too much space, which is not something we generally hear, but it is something that you know, may be underlying and causing you to spend more money than you uh, than you actually have or that you actually need to. Interestingly, in all the years I've been practicing and all the years my firm's been around before, we've never had a single client ever say, you know, we just have way too much storage space. There's just too many places to put things. Um, stuff expands to fill the space that you have and you may not realize you don't really need that much space. Um, the building's in the wrong location and we're gonna go over that later as well. You have an energy inefficient building um, that's a, a critical component that generally saps a lot of money out of organizations. We're going to talk about that later. Um, you've got constant maintenance headaches. You're continuously putting Band-Aids on things. You're never sure when or where the next fire is going to pop up. Usually turns out to be around 2 a.m. on a Sunday when you get a call that a pipe burst and you have programs scheduled to start on Monday morning. Um, that's usually when that happens. You've got outdated or inefficient equipment that really doesn't owe you anything because it outlived its lifespan 15 years ago. Um, you've got an old, tired-looking building that may be dark and drab and doesn't convey the welcoming and inviting atmosphere you're trying to portray to, to the community. Um, or you have hazmat issues. Uh, maybe no abatement of asbestos or lead paint or other hazardous materials was ever done. We've seen countless times a nonprofit goes to replace the flooring only to find that there's a layer of vinyl asbestos tile that's still sitting there underneath. Now everything has to stop until it's abated and it's removed. Um, these are things that just nobody ever thought about because you're going into older buildings that nobody took care of. Or the space doesn't align with your program or your program funding, as Ken was talking about before, um, which is a critical issue. Um, Ken, I don't know if you want to expand. Yeah, that. Before, before you jump off this page, there's just a couple of things I wanted to kind of talk about. Um, and I know we're going to be talking about some of these things in a little while, but from a constant maintenance headache um, perspective, it's not just really the fact that you're going to be investing additional um, money uh, and effort into um, maintenance. You also have to think about if you've got problems with um, the building where there's uh, maybe uneven floors or, you know, issues with, um, you know, within the building, you also have to worry about, um, you know, other things that kind of transcend the whole real estate issue uh, component. It could result in workers' compensation claims, right? You could have lawsuits where someone gets injured or, you know, issues there. Um, if uh, you could have, if people are constantly getting injured, there could be um, certain uh, justice center reporting that occurs there, um, which could really, if you get a lot of justice center um, reports, that could result in an, an audit of your facility. 
Um, you could have, and again, inefficient service delivery and added costs. And then the one comment I want to make about the um, space does not align with the program. You know, even if at times the space does align when you first kind of get involved with something, things change over time. You know, um, right now, uh, DYCD is in the process of um, looking or relooking at their contracts. And there's a lot of controversy over it because they've really changed from a, to more of a community-based look in how they're looking at these contracts. So if I've got a facility that's a larger facility that's not community-based, but I have everybody coming to me and I'm providing the services from a, a central point, um, there, you're going to start to see if these DYCD contracts go through, you're going to see a decrease in your revenue because you're not servicing the individuals within the communities. So you know when you're looking at something like this, you really have to understand how your funding is taking place and whether that funding is more community-based funding or whether that funding is um, really centralized where you can use a larger facility and a um, kind of a campus sort of format. So all of those things kind of have to kind of come into play. So let's get right into how we work on doing the analysis um, to determine what your actual needs are and, and develop a means to align the infrastructure with your mission, as Ken was talking about. Um, first thing to understand uh, in any building design project, which is essentially what we're talking about, is that it's solving a puzzle. Um, and like any puzzle, the first thing you have to do is identify what the puzzle pieces are. Um, what's critical that you have to address? The building program, which I'm going to talk about a lot, is really, um, as I'm going to say, the roadmap for how you do these things. It's a list of all of the spaces that you need to actual, actually function as a nonprofit, what their sizes are, the number of occupants that you need in each, um, what type of equipment that you need in each, the furniture that you need, adjacencies between one space and another, how the building works together so that it actually works for you, not against you. The location, what's your catchment area? Um, is there accessibility to public transportation? Um, Ken, you could talk about landlord and budget a little bit, you know, better from a financial standpoint about how these things play into, uh, into, um, into effect. Yeah, I mean, I, I think what you find is that when you're, you're dealing with, um, you know, initially getting into a, a lease space, um, you know, there's going to be some level of, and Glenn, you know, as the architect, there's going to be some level of construction that needs to take place in, in most spaces. It's rare that you find a space that you can kind of just walk into and it fits your organization perfectly. So there's gonna be some level of build out that needs to take place. And the question really comes down to, if you're doing that build out, you always have to consider those upfront costs, right? There are two types of costs that come into play when you're, you're dealing with um, occupancy. You're, you have your upfront costs, which is you know, your cost for the, the build out and everything else. And then you have your ongoing costs, which is the ongoing rent that you're paying or um, ongoing repairs and maintenance if you own the building and everything else. So, you know, when you're going into a space, the, the question really comes down to, you know, are you in a situation where you're going to be doing the, um, the build out of the space, um, which will then lower your ongoing rent? Is the landlord going to do it? And remember, the landlord wants to get paid for it. So if the landlord's going to be doing the concessions and build out, they're going to be charging you a higher rent for that space. And then if they charge you a higher rent, when you're dealing with those increments every year, you know, where you have a 2% or 3% increase, that 2 to 3% increase is going to be added on top of those building, uh, added building costs the landlord put in place. So in the long run, it could cost you more money. So you have to really kind of look at it from that perspective. In addition, you have to understand who your landlord is, right? Is your landlord a for-profit organization or is it a nonprofit organization? If your landlord is a for-profit organization, then your landlord doesn't have a um, real property tax exemption. So when you're looking at your um, cost, your ongoing cost for your uh, organization, it, it's not just the rent, but there's usually pass-through costs that come into play. And those pass-through costs also include uh, a share of those real estate taxes. So if you're going to be renting from a for-profit landlord, there's going to be real estate tax pushed through that comes through those pass-through costs, where if you're renting from a nonprofit landlord, um, there's a good chance that that nonprofit landlord has a, um, a real, real property exemption. Also, are you in a direct lease or you're leasing, uh, is it a sublease? Because you might not have the same rights in a sublease that you have in a uh, direct lease. Also, um, the sublease might be at favorable terms because the person who's leasing the space to begin with may not need that space and they just want to cover some of their costs. 
And if that sublease expires in two years, now you got to renegotiate with the landlord, you might not be able to get rents at, at similar terms, those rents might be significantly higher. So you really have to understand a lot of these pieces, because if you don't, um, you might be in, to, in for a rude awakening down the road. And then since I'm here, I might as well deal with the, uh, the budget piece of it too. Um, you know, so again, when you're dealing with the, the budget, you got to kind of think about, and this goes back to that feasibility study I was talking about before, how much do you have available to spend, right? I mean, what's your budget in terms of, or what are your resources up front to be able to either buy that building or do the concessions? How much are you going to put down? Um, where's the rest of the money going to come from? Is it going to come through if it's a lease, a landlord concession? If it's not a lease, or even if it is a lease and you're going to be doing improvements, can you do a capital campaign to bring in money through fundraising? Um, do you have the ability to borrow money from a bank? Are you going to do a bond raise and, and do something through a bond raise? You know, so where are those, those funds going to come from? And if you own the building and you are doing a bond raise, there might be a need for certain cash reserves that you have to set aside. So when you think about it and you say, all right, my building is going to cost me five million, and if I'm doing a bond raise, I may have to put another five hundred thousand dollars away in a cash reserve um, because the bond is going to require that. So you really have to make sure that you understand the terms of everything up front, because if you don't understand the terms, you can leave yourself short in terms of um, the amount of money that you have available to you. So again, consider your upfront cost, which is your build out, your leasehold improvements and things like that. And then also consider your ongoing costs uh, and that'll be built into your budget, your rent, repairs, utilities and everything else. And when I talk about budget, there are two types of budgets I typically like to think about. I like to think about your operational budget, um, which is where your traditional costs, rents, repairs, all that stuff goes through your pass throughs. But then you also should be thinking about, and I know we'll talk about this a little bit more later, but a capital budget especially if you own your building, because uh, over time, you need to make make significant improvements to your building. Um, you know, you may need a new roof. I mean, we just had to put a new roof on our building um, over the, the winter. And it came with a big, big price tag. You know, so if you're not considering those things, and if you're not factoring those things into um, putting money away into a reserve fund to cover them, you might be fine all along until that one big nut hits. And then there's like, where's the money going to come from? Go ahead, all sorry. These things, yeah, all of these things permeate through to every decision that you make as you go forward, as you're doing this analysis. Um, in addition to the financial aspect, there's a schedule. When do you need the space? When is it going to be available? If you're leasing or you're buying, when is it going to be online for you? Um, if you're planning on doing work within an existing building, does that building need to remain in operation during construction? We run into this all the time. How do you phase in the work so that you minimize disruption to the uh, to the daily activities, the daily operations? A lot of times it's about scheduling work after hours. It's about making sure you have um, you know dust mitigation, um, really understanding how it's going to minimally impact your operations. If you have swing space, even better. Um, but that always becomes a critical component. What are these puzzle pieces? The last one that I'm going to talk about are the codes and regulations, which is really, and I'll talk about this later also, about health, safety, and welfare. But you have issues that you have to deal with with the zoning code, the building code, the energy code, the FGI code, if you have any type of Medicaid reimbursed healthcare facility, um, SED, State Education Department, and the manual planning standards, if you're doing any type of K through 12 uh, work that requires their oversight. An accreditation commission with higher ed have to make sure you're providing the right spaces in order to achieve your accreditation for the programs that you're providing. OCFS, Office of Child and Family Services, they have oversight. And with virtually any building that you do, whether it's lease space, new space, whatever it is, complying with ADA, the Americans with Disabilities Act for barrier-free design. All very critical components. And all of these things really make up these puzzle pieces upon which we're now going to start to look at how you analyze what it is you actually need. So Glenn, before we jump over, there is a question in the chat. Um, basically, Amy, Amy Zelensky is asking, Zelensky, I'm sorry, is asking, can you talk about the issues to consider when thinking about a warehouse collaboration with other nonprofits? Sure. Um, it depends on the use. Um, it depends on what you're going to be using that space for. Um, if we're talking about using it as warehouse space for whatever back functions you need. Um, you know, I'm not exactly sure I understand the question fully, but in if you're talking about dividing the space, 
or if you're talking about developing the space into actual usable program areas, those are two divergent things. One that was required, you know, a much higher intensity of development, especially when it comes to parking. Um, another one is really just the question of the allocation of space. And how yeah, you Glenn, this is going to be for warehouse space. I know the organization. Um, one okay. of the things that that we see is whenever you're sharing space with other um, tenants, um, the things you have to be very careful about is um, who's bringing what to the table, uh, how is the rent and the space going to be divvied up, um, how do we uh, make it equitable for everyone, uh, is it going to be done through um, a joint venture or is each um, party going to be renting the space directly from the landlord um, and there's going to be entering into their own individual lease. Um, so there's a lot of things that have to be considered in terms of when you're going to be collaborating with another um, organization with respect to space. Um, so again, I, I think it's, you know, we're going to, we'll dive into some other stuff, but I think that's something that uh, Amy, if you want to, you know, follow up on uh, Glenn and I would be more than happy to talk to you uh, offline on that. Yeah, right. and that, that actually is a great, you know, illustration of how specific some of these topics are. Uh, because like, as I said, while there are best practices, each individual organization is going to have different issues that they have to tackle. Um, and they really need to be worked on individually and specifically so that it satisfies your requirements in a way that's going to minimize whatever your costs are and work for you operationally. Um, some of the considerations that, that we think about when we're getting into an analysis like this, and it, it really applies to virtually any type of nonprofit that you can think of. Doesn't matter, daycare center, educational facility, healthcare facility, a community center, housing, senior housing, senior care, a soup kitchen, dance studio, performance space, museum, library office. I list some of these here, but the reality is it really applies to virtually any nonprofit. Um, and the most important thing, try to determine what infrastructure is needed, not just now, but also in the foreseeable future, going out you know, to your growth projections, as Ken talked about, five years, 10 years, 15 years. How are your programs going to evolve over time so that you can try and um, plan for, through flexibility, what type of space you're actually going to need? Critical, if you have an existing building or buildings, in order to do this analysis, and you can do this analysis, forget what you have. Don't think about your existing space. Just pretend you're starting from scratch. At the end, we're going to see if what you have um, is what you really need. And then if it's not, make modifications um, without making big expenditures. But in order to do this, you have to kind of clear your mind um, of anything that you might have and start out and say, if I were to start from scratch, what actually do I need to, to operate? What do I need to provide my services and my programming? Not what kind of... Um, uh, accommodations am I making for myself? Um, what kind of compromises am I making? But how do I start from scratch? The services you provide are going to drive the types of spaces that for both programming and um, to comply with the applicable codes. That's a critical component of the analysis. Um, and then, you know, as, as Ken had pointed out at one point when we were talking, or you need centralized or, or you better serve with a community-based model in multiple communities. And Ken, maybe you can just describe that briefly. Um, as yeah, well. Sure. I mean, when, when you're dealing with, um, you know, your services, you got to look at your service model, right? You have to understand um, how you're going to most effectively deliver on your mission. And some of the delivery of mission requires you to be within the communities and providing services directly in the communities and um, the communities to have access to you because you're in those specific communities. Um, so when you're looking at your service model, I mean, if your service model is a community-based model and you need to have physical space or physical presence within those communities, you know, developing a, a big campus isn't going to make um, the most sense for your organization. So you really have to kind of look at um, the model and you have to understand that every decision or every um, way you lay this out is going to have a different um, result. So again, in a community-based uh, model, you're more fragmented so it might be a little bit harder from a uh, supervision and oversight perspective, and it might have additional labor costs being in a community-based model where, you know, if you're in a more centralized model, those labor costs might be lower because it might be easier for oversight, um, but that might not be the best way of delivering your services. So, you know, when you're looking at your space needs, it's not just about how much space I need, but it's 
what type of space I need, where does that space need to be in order for me to be effective, in order to meet the uh, needs of the people I serve. All right, so let's go through. If, if first, last thing that's on this, and I think it's an absolutely critical thing. We go through this with with virtually every nonprofit that we work with. At the end of the day, when we go through this exercise, there must be a single individual or a very small committee of people that are going to make final decisions because there will be decisions to be made. And if it's opened up to too many people, large community, large boards, it's chaos. It's absolute chaos and nothing ever gets achieved. So it, in the very beginning, you have to designate who is going to make the, the final decisions, the executive director, the CEO, the president, whoever it may be. First step in this process, you got to identify who your user groups are. Um, and again, it's going to vary depending on the type of organization, type of services you provide. But generally, what we're going to see are the administration, staff, students, if it's a school facility, faculty, board members, certainly in a non-for-profit, in, especially in healthcare, you'll see patients, residents, participants, families absolutely are part of or a user group in and among themselves, community members that you may be reaching out to, alumni who are graduates or, or used to be part of the program, donors want to be heard, um, any other recipients of your services. And it, the critical reason for involving these people is that when you start to ask the questions, they want to know that A, they were heard, they had an opportunity to participate, they're less likely to complain, more likely to be part of the organization and want to take part in the organization and feel like they had some authorship in whatever was developed. Glenn, before you switch slides, um, the other thing that you got to keep in mind is you need to make sure that you consider your funders, right? Because um, some of the space that you're going to be moving into, you may need your funders approval on the space. So you need to make sure that you link your funders in, uh, especially again, I know there's a bunch of educational organizations on, you know, if you're working with the state education department, you're going to need state education to pro approval of the space. So um, just keep in mind that you want to have your funders in from both the approval of the space and also from an understanding of whether they're going to fund, because a lot of times organizations will move from one space to another. I mean, we're working with an organization right now who their um, current occupancy cost is about 5% of their budget. Now that's very, very low because they own their own building. The building's pretty much fully depreciated and everything else. Any space they're looking at now is gonna run them closer to 10 to 20% in terms of occupancy costs, in terms of um, growth and program. Question is, funders are under, under deficit funded contracts are paying about 5%. Are they gonna be willing to pay 10, 12, 15, 20, whatever it happens to be? in order for that growth and expansion to occur or even just moving the, the program. So you, you definitely want to keep your funders involved. You want to have them involved in some of the discussion um, with respect to programmatic growth and everything else to see if um, you know, they're going to be willing to give you the dollars that are going to be necessary because ultimately it's great to have the space. It's great to have a space that works for you and provides great services. But ultimately, at the end of the day, you also have to pay for it. So that takes us to what do we do with all this paper, with all this information and in these users um, and how do we find out what exactly it is we need to do. Um, the next step, and, and it's really where it's applicable, but it, it really is, we've done this with so many different nonprofits. You develop a set of surveys that are tailored to the specific user groups with questions that are specific to them and asking what they're looking for. And the sample size can be as big or as small as you want. Maybe it's just key staff members. Maybe it is just your funders. Um, but it's really important to reach out and find out exactly what is the heartbeat, what's going on. So what you have below you, um, and again, we've developed these for community centers, schools, healthcare organizations, you name it. Uh, they could be sent out through SurveyMonkey or through some other platform. But these are just two examples. The one on the left is one that we had done. This is just one page from what went out to the membership for a, um, a nonprofit building on a college campus that we were working on. And again, Simple questions. What regularly scheduled programs do you participate in at the center? How frequently do you participate? We want to know how often they're there. What programs would you like to see added that are currently not offered? What are we missing out on? Um, and do you currently participate in these programs someplace else? And if so, where? What's our competition doing? How do we bring you in? And once we get you, how do we keep you here more often? And how many people do we need to accommodate? The one on the right was one that we did for a community center. And again, this was geared towards your um, staff. And it was just one page talking about what they're currently running. Uh, talks about you know what programs are you currently running or will be running in the immediate future. 
What spaces are you using for those programs? How is the space used? What days and times of the day is the space being used? Again, we're looking at schedule. That's a com critical component to maximizing the efficiency and minimizing the expenditure. How many people use the space? How many people do we need to accommodate? That's what we're trying to get out of all of this information. And a list of all the equipment that's being used in the space for that program. How big does the space need to be? How many people are we trying to accommodate? How often are we trying to accommodate them? What types of different programs can we pack into individual spaces? That's really where we're going with all of this. Um, because again, we're trying to maximize our efficiency, minimize our expenditures. So some of our clients have actually even gone to the next step of holding focus groups. They bring in people from these different constituencies, let them talk to each other, hear each other out, understand what their concerns are, understand what's important to them. The idea and the whole goal behind this is to generate the, the data, generate the, um, the information to help us analyze what are the trends? Um, what are the spaces that we need to satisfy the demands of the population that we're trying to serve? That's really the goal of this, to develop that building program so that the spaces that we have are really just the spaces we need in a way that we need them and nothing else. Disregard the wishful swimming pool on the roof request. I say this only because this actually happened. We were working on a project and that was one of the responses. We've got to have a swimming pool on the roof. Sure, if you're willing to donate a million dollars, we'll put a swimming pool on the roof. But it happens with every um, every survey and there's always someone who's got an idea and you've got to be able to toss away the ridiculousness. And that's why I say at the end of the day, there's gotta be a single person or a small committee that makes these decisions. Um, as we analyze the responses, we're looking to zero in on just the core needs. What exactly do we need? And it's important to ask the tough questions, maximize the flexibility of every single space, because that's gonna reduce the overall square footage to just what you really need um, without compromising the delivery of services. That's the most important thing. Flexibility of use is the key to maximizing the efficiency of the operation and minimizing your costs. Um, we're looking to maximize that efficiency by looking at similarities. Um, we're looking not to duplicate spaces. For instance, and we've run into this many times, if you're running a school, a daycare center, a community center, classrooms and meeting rooms share space through scheduling all the time. What we need to determine is what is the maximum number of spaces you need at any one time and how many people do you need to have in those spaces? Because you have a flexibility of use for similar types of spaces. If you're running a healthcare facility, like an Article 28 clinic, and we deal with this too, multiple specialties can share exam rooms and treatment rooms purely through scheduling. It could be times of day, it could be days of the week, but the equipment and the facilities that you need are the same. And if you can cut down on the number of rooms that you need and cut down on square footage, you're cutting down on your operating budget. You don't need to take care of as many spaces. We're doable. We look at how remote work and hoteling can, can mean fewer offices and workstations, primarily for back office staff, not your front facing staff, not your program staff, but people who are working in the background Hoteling is just a means of people sharing workstations, um, and it all depends on scheduling. Again, scheduling becomes a very critical component in this. Painful as it may be for some, and we've dealt with this, you got to ditch the old executive boardroom. It's used once per quarter, once per month, especially now that you have virtual meetings. Maybe it's not used at all. We had one project. We had one client with a healthcare facility. The boardroom was considered sacred space. We were not allowed to touch it. It was prime real estate. It could have very easily be used for more programming space, a more resident space. Um, they could have generated income from it, but they considered it to be sacred space and we could not touch it. It's time to get rid of those things, especially now that most boards are meeting virtually anyway. Technology um, can be used to transform spaces from one use to another or from one user to another, very simply. Um, the more technology that we use, the more flexibility we build into individual spaces. Lighting can be changed and programmed. IT and AV, once it's in the space, can be used for multiple different things. Things like smart glass, which is a little bit more costly, but it's still very effective, can transform a wall from being opaque to transparent. Um, even to the extent of using Oculus goggles, I know it's, you know, it's, it's kind of like the next thing and the latest thing. But again, a lot of the things are happening more virtually um, by using things like Oculus goggles. Um, to do the same types of functions we used to do where people were face-to-face, -face, now we can do them remotely. But again, it's not about that specifically, it's about 
It's about exploiting the use of technology to maximize the flexibility of rooms and spaces to minimize the overall square footage. Yeah, the one comment I want to make there is remember that, you know, technology is creating tremendous advancements, right? So the space you need today may not be the space you need tomorrow because of the changes in technology that Glenn is talking about. So kind of keep that in mind as you're going through, um, you know, some of your, obviously you can't know where, you know, the next five or 10 years are going to take us, but understand it's going to take us somewhere and there's going to be increased technology that's going to um, most likely allow things to be done more flexibly and easily. So um, kind of keep that in mind when you're negotiating leases or negotiating terms and stuff that you may not need the same space tomorrow as you need today. Perfect. Um, so now we get into the regulatory part of this because we've identified the spaces that you need. We've gone through the exercise of figuring out what spaces do you need to actually function, minimizing the number of spaces through flexibility. Um, and now we, we lay over on top of this, this regulatory requirement. Um, with these various codes. And, and these, again, could be the building code, FGI, manual planning standards, ADA, any other code that's got information. And again, most of these have to do with health, safety, and welfare. They're going to dictate the maximum number of occupants you can have in a space, the size of your corridors, the number of toilet fixtures you need, the number of exits, the distances to the exits, your accessibility requirements, the types of allowable construction, what types of clinical spaces or support spaces do you need this to, to um, add on to your, uh, your program spaces, the amount and maximum distance to natural light that you need, that's a code requirement amount of natural ventilation that you need in various spaces. Some spaces are required to have them. It's a difference between an occupiable space and a habitable space. Um, and there are different requirements depending on what those are. Um, we're working on one building right now where the existing corridors are too narrow by current code standards. There's no choice. We have to make them bigger, which means that the spaces around them are gonna wind up becoming a little bit smaller or have to be recast so that they work. We can't get it approved the way it is right now. So these are just another layer of information that's going to be added to where we're going with this and where we're going to wind up ultimately is what I talked about earlier, the building program. So once you've winnowed down all of the information that you've gone through, all of the data that you have, the results are going to form the basis of this building program. It's one of the puzzle pieces I spoke about. Um, it's going to provide the roadmap by which you can determine how to make your existing building work for you or how a new building should be laid out and how large it really needs to be. What you're seeing now is an example, a small example um, from a building program for a community facility that we did. Um, you can see the, the, the different categories, the department, the space, the number of spaces, the occupants per space, the square footage, the area, that is the critical piece to this thing. And then comments of where it needs to be, what kind of equipment. We take this, and if you look at that, that column called area, at the end, we're going to total up all of the square footage that we need just for the spaces that are necessary. And then we're going to apply to that a factor of about 30 to 35% for construction and circulation. At the end, what we're going to wind up is the required gross square footage for the building that you need to operate effectively with just the spaces that you require both now and in the foreseeable future. Here's how this comes together now. For an existing facility, and remember I said forget about what you have, now you're going to think about what you have. You're going to overlay the results of this building program on top of your current layout with no preconceived ideas and see where you can make reasonable changes that are going to improve the efficiency of the operations just by having spaces where you need them in a configuration that works for your current operations and programs and foreseeable future. You may find that you're paying for too much space and you don't really need it, or you're going to find you don't have enough space. We use that age old adage, you know, you can't fit a quart in a pint bottle. That if the math doesn't work and you can't fit all of your program spaces that you've determined you need square footage wise in the size building you have, it's never going to work no matter how much you try and massage it. Remember, Glenn, how do you, sorry, go ahead. I was going to say that remember that a space that right now is used for one function may actually serve better and more efficiently as something else. And this is something that we see more often than you would think. When you're going through an analysis like this, Glenn, how do you factor in uh, future need? Um, and how far out should you be thinking in terms of the future needs of the organization in terms of, you said, the foreseeable future? What What is the definition of foreseeable future? Great, great question. So no one's got to, you know, everyone's crystal ball is just as good as everyone else's. But being entrenched in whatever programs you're you're providing, you can kind of 
um, see where things may be going in the future by building in the flexibility in the space so that it's not just going to be for one function only. Some spaces, you don't have a choice. But as I talked about technology, as I talked about you know lighting and things like that, you have the ability, the opportunity of transforming a space that today may be used for one thing. Maybe it's a classroom, um, but maybe it's also a meeting room. Maybe it becomes a dance studio if you have the right infrastructure there just by making a few changes. You have to be able to project out. We usually say, think about things five years, 10 years down the road. Getting 15 years out is a little bit tough because who knows what's really going to be there. Um, but if you can project out that five and maybe 10 years to how your enrollment is going to increase over time or what you want your enrollment to increase to over time. How, you know, one of the issues that we see a lot today, especially with schools is, yeah, we can increase enrollment a lot, but we can't find teachers. We can't find staff. You know, we'd love to add all of these classrooms, but we don't have anybody to teach the kids. There are ratios and proportions that you think about, especially in a daycare center where you're maxed out. You have one teacher and one aide for 18 students. You can only have 20 students, but if you go the extra two, you've got to add an additional aide. Financially, it doesn't make sense. You're not going to pay for the additional employee only to grab two more students. Their income uh, is not going to generate enough to uh, justify it. So that's a factor that you have to think about, not just growing the program, but also the staff that you're going to need to serve those programs. Um, and it's really, as I said, an individual thing based upon the nonprofit itself. But you don't want to waste money on space that you can't fill today. You just have to think about how can I convert this space easily to something in the future? And we do that by using the technology as best as we can and making the spaces as easily convertible as we possibly can. And that's really done on an individual basis based upon um, what the nonprofit's usage is. Uh, we have a, another couple of questions, but I'll throw one of them out now. Um, so somebody is asking is, can you speak on the resources available to nonprofits to help guide them through the process of navigating these decisions? Nonprofit leaders are stretched too thin and it is a uh, daunting process that requires resources and expertise that many organizations just don't have. So where do they where do they get help? Well, I, I so now I'm going to sound like I'm a, a commercial for the AIA, but it's it's critically important that you bring in whether it's an architect. Um, in some cases, you can do it with an interior designer, but somebody who understands um, how to design, how to lay out spaces, how to convert all of this information into a usable plan for you. We work with our clients to develop these types of surveys um, because we understand the kind of questions that we need to answer it in order to put together this building program, but they have the information that's needed to fill in all of those questions. What types of spaces, what types of programs do you currently run? It's really um, working together. And if you have somebody that you bring in, a consultant, who's going to sit down and say, Let's start out, let's put together the team. Who on your team, and we recognize your resources are stretched thin, you don't have a lot of time, you're doing a million things. Um, what is the minimal amount of information that we need to glean from those people to start to put together the survey that we can then send out to whoever it is you determine are the right people to ask the questions of? You've gotta be able to bring somebody in who can guide you through this process. It's not something, unless you've done it yourself before, it's not necessarily something that's easy to do um, on your own. Um, you're better off having somebody who has you know, been through the ropes, who, who understands what kind of questions to ask. Um, and as we say all the time, you know, as architects, it's important for us to get inside the heads of our clients and understand their operations as well as they do. Um, because it's the only way that we can come up with solutions to these puzzles that are gonna satisfy them both operationally, financially, now, and as we say, in the foreseeable future. So it's important to bring in the right people, put together the right team, so that you don't have to do all of this yourself, because it's a tremendous amount of work. In the end, it's worth it. Um, but again, you know, you're busy, you know, doing programming, and um, that's really where your efforts need to, uh, need to lie. Now we're going to jump to the next part of this thing, and we're going to talk about site a little bit. Um, I know we're running a little bit low on time, but let's say you know you're looking to build or you're looking to lease someplace new. Remember, the goal is to minimize the cost. So 
Why does the site matter? First, what's your catchment area? Where are people coming from? Where are the people you wish to serve? Are you bringing people to the programs or you're bringing programs to the people? If you're bringing people to the programs, are they driving, taking mass transit, or are you providing transportation? How far are people willing to travel to get to you? If you're bringing the programs to the people you serve, what's a practical distance for your staff to travel? How much can you afford to spend on fuel? Um, you know, we worked with one non-for-profit who made the courageous decision to sell their building because they were not in a good location. Um, they were isolated. And once they moved and they took out space and they leased it, they're thriving. Um, it's a, it, was a, it was a courageous decision, but one that the board felt they had to do, and it worked out for them. Another puzzle piece that we uh, have to look at is the zoning code when we look at where you can um, actually do this. You know, where is your use permitted as of right or with minimal variances? How large a building can you build? How many stories can it be? How much of the lot can you cover? Where on the site can the building be located? If it's an existing building, can your use actually go there? Parking, how much parking is required? I talked about this with industrial conversions before. You know, it's an enticing thing to do if you want to use it for program space, but most industrial buildings and sites do not have sufficient parking because the requirement was much less for industrial than it is for community use. Um, where are drop-offs located? How much landscaping is required? If you're in a residential zone, you're going to be required to have a large landscape buffer. That's another expense, and it also takes away from your usable area. We use the results of the building program um, to help determine whether a particular site or building is going to work based upon the results of the zoning code analysis. You know how large a building you need now. You've gone through that exercise. Now we have to figure out where it's going to fit. If you find a site uh, if you find that you, you need a 10,000 square foot building, but a site's only going to permit a 5,000 square foot building, seems pretty obvious. Keep on looking. Are there sewers in the area or you need an on-site sewage treatment facility? That's a big expense. Is the cost per square foot um, to rent or purchase acceptable? And if it's not, if it's too much, you can move on. I know, Ken, you've probably experienced this, you know, with, with some of your clients as well. Yeah, I mean, definitely. I mean, there from a, uh, a rent perspective, um, you know, you're constantly looking at does does and I talked about it before. Does does this fit in line with the funding that you're getting from your your funders? And it comes back to really understanding um, how you get paid. I mean, are you getting paid on a FIFA service basis? Um, and you know, does this space then accommodate your ability to bring on uh, more individuals and provide more service and get paid for them? Or is it a cost-based reimbursement system where then you're at the whim of you know your funder, and if your funder is not going to give you additional dollars? and you can't fit the rent that you have to pay for this space in, it just doesn't make sense. The other thing you gotta keep in mind is when you're dealing with rent, there's gonna be increments every year, right? And is the um, revenue that you're getting from your funders, is that gonna grow at the same rate or more than your rental income? Um, if you've been providing early intervention services over the last 10 years, early intervention hasn't gotten an increase in 10 years. So if you're in a space and you've been paying rent increases every year for the last 10 years, um, you've just outstripped a lot of the profitability, if any profitability you had in a, that program. So again, you have to look at what are the rent increases and everything else. So it's not just what's the square foot today, but what's it going to be over time? And do we expect that the, um, the rates that we're going to get paid for the services that we're providing are going to keep up with the rental increases? So, and, and keep in mind, it's a critical member of the team is a really knowledgeable real estate broker who understands both your needs and the market. Um, they have to really understand what you're looking for, what your sensitivities are. Um, critical member of the team. We've worked some, with some phenomenal ones, uh, but they're extremely important. So now we're going to try and get through this. We talk about, you know, minimizing the infrastructure expenses. You've got a building. Congratulations. You get, went through the analysis. You determined exactly what you need now and in the foreseeable future to, you know, to operate and effectively um, run your programs. Now you need to make sure you're going to minimize your ongoing infrastructure expenses and make sure that they're predictable. So, Ken, why don't you... Uh, yeah, so you as I said earlier, um, occupancy costs are probably the second most expensive costs that you're going to incur. Um, within the, your organization. Um, and when you, you're kind of looking at this, you, you really need to understand from a, a cost perspective and, and how you can kind of save cost along the way um, in a lot of different areas. So one of the things that uh, we often recommend is that you have a, a efficiency audit done of your facility. Because the first step you really want to do is if you're moving into a space, you want to understand not just what the rent is going to be, but what all of the other costs associated with that space is going to be too. 
Um, just because you're paying certain price in, in the building or the uh, area you are now may not be the same cost if you move to a new facility. So you really have to gain an understanding of you know, what the costs are there and if there are any ways that you can cut down the costs. As uh, Glenn mentioned earlier, every dollar spent is a, a potentially a dollar wasted. So you want to make sure that you're not necessarily wasting those costs. So you'll be, you, know, you should be looking at things like you know, your electricity usage. You know, should I be looking at you know, um, more efficiency lighting in, in play? Um, am I uh, utilizing the best uh, water to the, the maximum potential? Um, I can uh, use or, or change the way I'm, um, you know, the, the toilet flushes work and everything else, so it'll reduce the amount of water that's being used. Again, going back to the electricity, I, I can have things where um, the electricity, electricity gets turned off in rooms where people aren't necessarily unless there's movement. Uh, same thing with, um, you know, the um, HVAC, the, you know, the uh, heat and the um, air conditioning, you know, if with the technology that exists today, um, that technology can really, you know, uh, keep rooms at the, the maximum because there are going to be certain times a day when you have more staff on site and you have more staff on site on a particular uh, time of the day, you're going to need less heat because there's more bodies. So you got, or you might need more air conditioning because you've got more bodies. So you really have to kind of look at the operations of your business. You have to look at um, the different components of it and you have to figure out, you know, how you can reduce those costs because if I can reduce costs in one place, that's going to help me. Repairs again, coming back to um, staying on top of that, having that uh, capital budget and setting up a capital reserve fund, um, you know, throughout the year where you kind of factor that in as one of your budgeted costs. So you're putting money each year into a capital reserve fund. So you have the resources you need uh, to move forward. I, I know we're running out of time, so I'm just going to stop here and let Glenn go over the last slide or two before we, we have to close up. All right. I'll, I'm going to jump on because I think Ken gave me a great uh, leeway here. Some of the ways that we look at reducing um, infrastructure costs, some passive approaches, having proper roof and wall insulation, um, energy efficient insulated window units. Many older buildings still have single pane glass increasing the use of natural light where possible, using durable and attractive materials that require little or no maintenance, especially in an environment where your participants may act out or abuse their surroundings. We've been involved with designs with people with developmental disabilities, and unfortunately, this becomes an issue. Active systems, as Ken talked about, a BMS system or building management system for your HVAC system, which is controllable and um, programmable that, you know, really on a smartphone. LED lights, you should all have them with occupancy sensors, motion sensors, daylight sensors, and a lighting control system. Some of these things are code-driven. Some of them are just good practices and will save you a tremendous amount on your energy costs. Rebate programs, Ken, I know, you know we're running out of time, but um, you know there are government rebate programs, utility rebate programs that will help pay for some of these things. Yeah, I mean, we talked about we talked about a bunch of the things on the budget already. I mean, we we kind of talked about you know making sure that we allocate space uh, costs correctly, so that you know if you're allocating your space costs, you can kind of determine what programs they belong to, and you can then uh, use that to try to make sure you get properly funded for everything. Uh, understand the properly related costs. We talked about that. Uh, there's such a thing that um, if you rent a space and you sign a a lease for 30 years or more, or willing to sign a lease for 30 years or more with a for-profit landlord, you may be able to get what's called a, real, a leasehold condo. And if you get that leasehold condo, you might be able to avoid real estate taxes. So something to keep in mind if, if that's something that works for you. And we talked about the capital budget and making sure that, and that's another place where an architect or an engineer comes into play in terms of, you know, on a regular basis, having someone coming in and looking at your building and looking at your space and determining uh, what other costs are needed in order to uh, over the what period of time in order to be able to better manage the uh, capital uh, inflow into your organization. And with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Allison. Thank you so much to both of you. Uh, this was incredibly educational and informational. Okay, so if you have any other questions and you have not been able to answer them, please just shoot us an email. We'll do our best to take care of that for you. There will be a recording of this webinar available to you early next week. And again, I wanna thank both Glenn and Ken for your time and your knowledge and wisdom. Really, it was like very educational for me. So I'm sure for the other 35 people sitting on this call, it was as well. Um, I appreciate your time, both of you. If anybody has any questions directly for Ken or Glenn, 
Uh, we will be happy to put you in touch with them if you don't have direct contact information. And please do keep in touch with us. Let us know if there's anything you would like covered and keep in touch with our calendar of events. We are always offering great webinars and workshops like this. Thank you both and uh, have a great day. Thanks a lot, Allison. Thank you, Allison. Have a good one. So long, everyone.